Welcome to the Unmasked Podcast, where we are unmasking compromisers, cowards, and wolves, showing you what biblical Christianity is not, so that you may better understand what it is. I'm your host, Tyler Long. My co-host and brother in Christ is Joey Durantz. And last time, we left you with some questions about conscience. We're covering conscience again today. But Joey, I think it'd be a good idea to revisit those questions and answer them for the audience, since we kind of left them hanging purposely on that. Yeah, and I think some people had come to some conclusions already, even though I said last time that you could, it doesn't matter, your truth is your truth. (laughs) Now I'm going to say your conclusions could be wrong. All right, that's right. So we're going to put you to the test. We'll see how you answered them. So the first thing that we asked was, may a pastor drink whiskey? Joey, you want to take that one? Yeah, it is permissible. It's not something that's a sin. Getting drunk is always a sin. There's never a situation in which getting drunk is not sinful. That's always a sin. But having a drink is not something that's illegal according to Scripture. So there's nothing uh, morally evil for whiskey as compared to like wine? No, it's stronger. So it's stronger, I mean, so you're you need not going to have a glass right. of whiskey like you're right. going to have a glass of wine. Yeah. Um, but then again, there, I mean, there's principles that apply, as we'll see later in this episode, right. of when you should or shouldn't, right. uh, but just the act of drinking it in and of itself, it's not a sin. Good. No, I ask, because some people, when they see hard alcohol or something, they have a, a more visceral reaction than if they see a glass of wine. Well, yeah, if you're a king in, in Israel under the old covenant, you're not allowed to have it. Mm. Yeah, but we are freed from the Mosaic law. Yep. Good. All right, so here's a good one, Uh, but if anybody's been listening to our podcast for longer than a month, then uh, they'll know the answer to this, and that is, may a pastor mandate masks in church? (laughs) If he wants wants to sin. Yes, if he wants to sin, absolutely. Because anything that you mandate in church, you make an element of worship, correct? Yep. Good. uh, You can't mandate masks outside of church either, No. because that has to do with clothing. And the face is the one thing that's supposed to not be covered due to shame. Yes. Covering the face is shame. Covering everything else is we're supposed to do right. because of our shame before God, because of our sin. Amen. Yes. So, we could do a whole podcast episode on that in, in all likelihood. If and, that's something that you'd like to see, then you should comment below, we want to see that. Yes. If you would like that, let us know. Uh, how about a Christian getting a tattoo? No. Not a sin. Now, the one thing you have to think through, though, is it is going to change the way people look at you. There is a big talk today about being missionally minded, and I think we should be. I think where they get it and what they're looking at it, a lot of this movement is wrong. But if you get a tattoo, you've limited yourself. Right. Where you're able to go, I mean, you know, who's going to hire somebody if they've got a big old tattoo on their neck that goes up to their face? And right. then there's, there's cultures, too, when they see a tattoo, and they still look down on it. Right. So you're not going to be able to go over and minister to that culture and be all things to all people. So, but then again, there's like people that will get certain verses or certain concepts of scripture and things, and they'll just be walking billboards. And like, if you're living in LA or you're living in the Bay Area or something like that, or yeah, yeah you could get away at Portland, right? Walking around with your shirt off with a bunch of like scripture stuff, you're a walking billboard. Yeah, you could do that. Right. It's not inherently a sin. Right. So the issue then that really needs to be thought of, even in issues that aren't sin, that are issues of conscience, would be just because it's lawful doesn't mean that it's wise. Yeah. Right? And so as Christians, we should always pursue wisdom and living in in, in a wise manner that's going to not hinder us from our gospel work. Yeah. Right? Good. Yeah, and I think like with, with certain things like tattoos or anything that's going to be permanent, you, you want to be very, very careful having thought through it, prayed through it for a long period of time because you don't know where the Lord's going to bring you, what, what context he's going to call you in, right. and, and you don't want to limit his use of you right. by doing something like that. And likewise, if you're a believer but you got a lot of tattoos as an unbeliever and now maybe you're bothered a little bit by that, you don't have to rush out and get some laser surgery or anything. No. Right. No. no. It's a, you're another opportunity to talk about the gospel. Right. And you just would quite literally wear it on your sleeve or as your sleeve. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And God is sovereign and he called you the way you are and 
He will use you the way he wants to use you. Absolutely. How about dancing? Can a Christian go dancing? Dancing in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with it. There's certain kinds of dancing that aren't really dancing. It's just like fornication. Yeah, you don't want to dance, dance like Miley Cyrus. Yeah. Yeah. I, Twerking or whatever. Yeah. Something something like that. You want to think about like what's the purpose of it? Is it sensual? And we'll get into right. some of the principles of how to think through these things. But you want to go ballroom dancing? You right. want to you want to even do like swing dancing or something mm-hmm. like that? Uh, one thing that I think is really fun that that we like to do up here is um, when you get a group of people together and you do those like old fashioned dances. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Or you have like yeah. a hoedown kind of thing, and oh yeah, and you got a big old ring of people, and and yeah. you're you're doing all I, I don't what, do what's the dosey do. I don't yeah. know. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's there is a name for it. They do it. Yeah, I know. It's not line about. dancing, but you form a big line, and yeah, it's a lot yeah. of fun. Do that with my wife. Do that with my girls. Yep. It's it's fun. So here, this last one. This is a good one to go over because it's 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 in the church. Uh, can a Christian date a non-believer for the sake of the gospel? A Christian can't date a non-believer for any sake. Exactly. And you just saying that it's for the sake of the gospel is just you trying to color your sin in, in uh, beautiful tones. Yeah. Right. I have this picture. It's a meme. And it's like, it's Christian girls with their non-believing boyfriends and a picture of a sheep with a goat. And the, fa- the expressions on these animals are pretty funny. Right. And it's, it's like... There's so much wrong with the answers. No, so much wrong. But just like as an appeal to you, ladies, when you're looking for a husband, you want to look for someone that you know you can joyfully submit to. And he's going to point you in a direction that's going to make you look like and love Christ. And a non-believer is not going to do that. He's not going to have the same standards. It's not going to be the same thing. You, you want to be very, very careful not to choose someone because of their flesh. You want to choose someone because of that inner person, and you want someone that you know is going to point you to Christ even more. Yeah, and guys, you're not off the hook. Just because you're the leader in the household doesn't mean that you're free to uh, date and even marry a non-believer. No, because your wife has tremendous influence over you. We see this in the garden, right? So, no, what do you think is going to happen to you if you have a non-believer whispering in your ear and telling you that you need to prioritize my needs which is biblical that you're to put her needs above your own. But as an unbeliever, she's going to have no idea what those proper needs are. Yeah. So good. I hope that all of you at home answered those questions correctly. And we have a new round here that we're going to uh, just leave for you to consider. Uh, if you have the answer and you want to take a stab, go ahead and leave it in the comments section. But let's go into that. So f- new l- round of questions. Joey, can a Christian, may a Christian, attend a Roman Catholic Mass? That's the question. We'll leave it for next time. Question number two, may a Christian attend a wedding at a mosque? Number three, may a Christian attend a secular university? And just to one-up it, can I, how about a Christian attending Brigham Young University? And lastly, may a pastor watch mixed martial arts, MMA, like UFC-style fighting? So those are some good questions, a little bit tougher than the ones from last time. And uh, we'll see if they're growing at all in uh, the the issues and the uh, biblical principles that we're uh, covering in the last couple episodes here. So now let's get into it, Joey. Last time we talked uh, largely about what the conscience is. We defined it a little bit. We talked about the responsibility of a believer before God to to listen to his conscience, to inform his conscience. And we're going to continue in that theme. We're going to continue to define it, but we're going to do it uh, with a little more uh, focus on believers interacting and living amongst each other, especially in the context of the church, right? Yeah. So principle number one to remember in this regard is that no two people have the same consciences. And so we see this in Romans 14, uh, the whole chapter, but we'll just use uh, 14.1 uh, as, as, as the go-to. So 14.1 says, Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on opinions. So it's pretty expressed here that there are different opinions, and this isn't for the purpose of passing judgment. And it's also implied that you're to accept the one weak in the faith because their opinions are going to be different. Right? 
Yeah, and you'll notice in this section too, it talks a lot about judgment. And just as a, as a side note, I know I don't normally go into rabbit trails, <laughs> but just as a side note, we want to be really careful not to pull passages out of context. Like, for example, when it talks about God loving people, what, one of the things that you see people say um, is, look, God, see, look, God loves all of them. God loves all of them. God, but well, who is this written to? This is written to a specific church. He's calling these people believers. And so let's not take that and make a category error with it. With judgment here, notice these are in issues of conscience. Right. Where it's like there isn't God. We don't know the mind of God hard and fast on this issue. Right. Right or wrong. If there, if there is one, which there, there is and how we conduct it. But that doesn't mean that we don't know the mind of God on other issues. Right. That are right and wrong. And on those things, we are called to judge with righteous judgment. So on these things that are, aren't necessarily consequential, right. uh, they're, they're a diaphora, on these things, we're not to make judgment on people. Right, right. Yeah, so for issues where the Bible hasn't taught explicitly or implicitly, right? So for example, the Bible hasn't explicitly taught on child molestation. However, you can derive that that is sinful from a multitude of biblical principles. Oh, well, sexual immorality. Right, exactly. Yeah. Right. That's a catch-all right, 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 for right. anything outside of one husband, one wife. Yes. But like eating ice cream on the Lord's Day, making a milkshake on the Lord's Day, some people will say, no, I, I can't do that. And some people don't have a problem with it. We, we won't judge them on that. But if, yeah, if somebody's pursuing a relationship with a minor... Yep. It shouldn't be. Yep. We're going to pass a judgment on that. Absolutely. So we got 1 Corinthians 8, 7 drives this point home as well. It says, however, not all men have this knowledge, but some being accustomed to the idol until now eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. And so it speaks of not all men having this knowledge, which means some men do have this knowledge. And of course, that knowledge that he's referring to is the fact that we are free in this regard to eat meat sacrificed to an idol, right? Yeah. And, but some men don't have that knowledge. Yeah, right. and it, it's in the context, notice that there's strong and that there's weak. They're strong and weak, and we're going to get into we're, that. We've got categories. We're going to get into that. Um, so good, no two people have the same conscience, so we need to remember this in the context of the church and in the context with the church universal as well as we interact with one another. Because, and this brings us to our second point, a large percentage of conflicts within the church arise out of issues of the conscience, right? It's basically, we all agree on the express commands, we agree that we're to um, baptize and that we're to uh, partake of the Lord's Supper. We agree that the gospel should be preached. There, there's no division on that. Division typically comes up when it's in these areas where the Bible hasn't taken a side one way or another, right? Or it's given us some freedom or some liberty. Right, or it's given us freedom or liberty. And so um, that takes us to Romans 14. So Romans 14 was written to speak to this situation. It's basically a warning that this is going to be a cause of conflict in the church and the crux of this chapter we're not going to read it for the sake of time but it is to not pass judgment on one another when it's an issue that scripture has not issued a command yeah so you, you've got what you've got here is you've got two different cultures coming together and seeking to pursue unity when there's such big cultural differences and the temptation for them is the same temptation as it is for us what here is just cultural tradition that I can give up? And what here is something that has to do with sin and righteousness? Right. In which case, I am bound to obey. Right, right. So maybe to modernize this, let's say that uh, two churches merged and one was a predominantly uh, Northwest, because we're from the Pacific Northwest, white church, and the other one was a um, predominantly black church from the South. They have a decidedly different culture, right? Uh, black uh, churches ha are a little more uh, exuberant 
uh, you know, flamboyant and the pre preachers, uh, there's no such thing as a dull sermon in their churches. And this might uh, be a shock to those who aren't used to that environment. And let's say those two bodies came together, which is what you're having happen here, right? You got Jews and you got Gentiles, and the Jews especially have this religious history and traditions. And it's easy to hold on to traditions because they're, you're comfortable with them, but it doesn't mean that God has spoken to that. Yeah. Right? And where do you hang out? When you have people over, I mean, my family, I have a Sicilian background, and where, where are you going to hang out? And most, most American families are like this. A lot of cultures are because the fellowship happens around food. You hang out in the kitchen. That's where you hang out. Even if it's a small kitchen, you're all in there hanging out. Why? Because food brings people together. Yeah. And then now you've got this situation where certain foods are permissible and certain foods aren't permissible according to certain people's culture. Right. What do we do in those situations? Yeah. So if we started fellowshipping with somebody from Indonesia and they wanted to serve insects. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, I wouldn't eat them, but... I wouldn't call that sinful. Well, what if you offended them by, by not, not eating? eating the insect? Then I'd probably take one and eat and hope that I didn't throw up. Find out that it's actually really good. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so the other thing to see here in Romans 14 isn't just the warning against conflict, but it's also that there are categories, as you alluded to before. You do have the weak and the strong. And this is clear not only from Romans 14, but you see this in, in 1 Corinthians uh, 8 through 10, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more in, in a bit, but there is a position that is based in a stronger faith and a position that's based in, in a weaker faith, yep. right? And so what you see here in verses uh, 2 and 21 of Romans 14 is that the strong eat all kinds of foods, the weak eat only vegetables, right? And this, I'm, we're not talking about dietary, like if you think that eating vegetables is healthy and is going to help you run the race of faith, that's not what they're talking about here. They're talking about people who eat vegetables because they think eating meat is wrong. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So difference on that. You see that the strong make no distinction among days, and the weak value some days more than others. That's in verse 5. You see that the strong drink wine, or at least are open to drinking wine, and the weak abstain from wine, or are opposed to uh, drinking wine. That's in verses 17. Uh, and 21. So just to sum these up, Joey, the positions of the strong are the, those who their consciences are theologically informed, while the positions of the weak are theologically uninformed but are not heretical. Yeah, they, they, can, they can go that way. Yes. Yeah, there's either, either side can drift into heresy, right? Right, 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 right. Yeah, the strong or the weak, but yeah. We'll get into it. And just as a, as a plug, a great sermon that I would recommend on this is The Tyranny of the Weaker Brother by R.C. Sproul. It talks about how you're to bear all things for your weaker brother. You're not to cause him to stumble. But the second the weaker brother starts imposing his conscience on others as a prerequisite for worship, as a prerequisite for the gospel or anything like that, the gospel is threatened. Right. Yeah. And so there's a, there's a fine line. There's a lot of nuances here. Right. And Paul knows that. And one thing that we have to be very careful of is just looking at one specific action and saying, carte blanche, whole thing's sinful, got to get rid of it all. Because in an action, there's a whole bunch of moving parts right. that, that happen. And some of which is right, some of which is wrong. And if, you, if you've been following us at Master's Bible Church, or if you're a member with us, you know this as we've been looking at the extent of God's sovereignty, and does God cause sinful actions? Mm. And we've recognized, yes, God does cause sinful actions. Otherwise, those actions would not be able to be performed because in him we live and move. There's right. motion, there's actions, and have our being. But he never is the efficient cause of the sin in those actions. Right. Never. No. Because that, then that comes down to morality. But... We need our bodies and able to live. So like, for example, you know, stabbing someone in the neck. Is that wrong? Well, it depends on the situation. It could be you're performing a tracheotomy on somebody going into anaphylactic shock and you've got to save their life. It could be somebody broke into your house in the middle of the night and the closest thing you could find, you know, is a letter opener. Right. And like all, or it could just be that you have it out for this person and you're upset they got the job you wanted. 
The last one is sin. The first two aren't, but the action is the same in all of them, and God gives us the motion for it. Right, so God causes the motion and the end result. We're responsible for our motives. Yeah, and so that's why when we're looking at these, we can't just say, oh yeah, this is right, this is wrong, wholesale. We've got to look at the components in it, and, and then it, there's another twist at the end too, which I'll save for later. All right, and the thrust of Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians and Romans is that when he talks about the weaker and the stronger brother, it's implicit and it's clear. Where should a Christian be going? But by defining one position as weak and another position as strong, if we're to pursue the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord, it stands to reason that part of sanctification is moving from the position of the weaker brother to the stronger brother. Yeah. Because that is the correct position. And before you just amen that, I, I want to encourage you to stop <laughs> thinking that you automatically are the stronger brother mm -hmm. and question whether or not you are the stronger brother. If you really are the stronger brother, you'll be able, hopefully by this episode and the next one, at least to get a start in the direction that you should be going to figure that out. But oftentimes, it's all of us right. that will say, I'm the stronger brother. But right. in fact, many are the weaker ones. Yes, and I don't want to ruin it because we're going to get to it a little bit later when we get into matters of conscience versus conscience involvement. Uh, we'll go over a few of those scenarios where uh, we may end up uh, challenging you a little bit if you assume you're the stronger brother um, because people t can be strong in certain areas but weak in others, right? Good. So based on these things, so they, we have different consciences and it's a cause for conflict uh, in the church. We have an obligation as believers to protect and inform others' consciences, yeah. right? And these go hand in hand. So let's open to uh, 1 Corinthians 10. I'm going to read verses 28 and 29. We see here, But if anyone says to you, this meat is consecrated to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for conscience's sake. I do not mean your own conscience, but the other person's. For why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? So he brings a lot here, a lot of uh, great uh, colors for this discussion that we're having, right? It's, it says to not eat for their sake, right, Joey? Yeah. So this is the protection of the, the weaker brother. Yeah, I, that's what I would say. I would say the one who informed you is probably going to be a non -believer. Or even a non-believer, yes, excuse me. Yeah. But, but the other one, the other, in verse 29... I would say those are weaker brothers that are present. Right, right. So that's a great point, and I don't want to gloss over that. We even have an obligation for the conscience of the unbeliever. Yeah. Right? That we shouldn't cause them to stumble or to see sin in us, even just perceived. Right? Just perceive. It's not sin, but if they perceive it as sin, and you know they're going to perceive it as sin, what's that going to say about your God? Yeah. Right? And we need to be mindful of that. Right, And so he, we see this driven home by Paul in Romans 15 as well. So Romans 15, 1 says, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. So we see this obligation. And then he goes on down in verse 7, Therefore accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. So you see this protection. We who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength. So what this is talking about is just because you have freedom doesn't mean that you're to exercise it universally. In fact, part of the mark of your maturity is that you know the freedoms you have and you forsake them for the sake of your brother. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, that's what he's getting into here. Yeah. We have these rights and we have these freedoms in order that we would lay them down. And you touched on it, if you just look at that, it's one word in Greek, two in English, just as, in verse 7. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now we have a standard. Now we have a model that we're to follow after. Right, right. And we remember from uh, 1 Corinthians ten twenty nine, where he warned that it's not for your sake, because why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? So he's saying explicitly there, their conscience isn't judging you. It's not that we are succumbing to their judgment. In fact, that's where you get back to the tyranny of the weaker brother. You should bear all things, but the second that the weaker brother attempts to make this 
an imperative for Christian faith, then you have an obligation to stand up to him. Yeah. Right? Once it's demanded of you. Right. Once it's demanded, because that's his point here. Why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? Because it's not about them judging. It's about you not causing them to stumble. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. It's an important distinction. So like if we think back to the, uh, the pastor having whiskey, mm-hmm. that's why it, yeah, in and of itself, yeah, that's fine. But if he's going and then hanging out at a church function and pulling out a flask and having some whiskey, <laughs> right? Now he's not giving concern for the other people there and what that might do to their conscience. Right, right. Yeah, especially with the appearance of it. The one sip isn't a sin. However, you pre-planned and concealed alcohol to bring into a party, like, are you that overcome by it? Yeah, right. you, you can't just wait. Right. Yeah, you have the freedom to drink it, but right. is it profitable? Do you need it now? Right. Can that would not wait? be a good message to, yeah. to the other believers. And so we see the implied thrust, we talked about that, of the stronger and the weaker brother, and that the weaker brother should grow into the position of the stronger brother. So let's talk about how these interact. So we're to protect the conscience of the weaker brother, but they're to grow. So how does this happen? That's so, a good question. So, so this, this is where we're going to get into the obligation that we have to inform the conscience of our weaker brothers, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think a place to go is 1 Corinthians 8. 1 Corinthians 8, and I'm thinking all the way up through 11, is one section, the more that I've been looking at it. Because when you, when you start reading through 1 Corinthians, one of the things that you see, chapter 7, 1, now concerning things. Chapter 8, 1, now concerning things. And then... And then you don't see it again until chapter 12, mm-hmm. now concerning spiritual gifts. And then I think you see it again in 16. He's breaking this up. And this section here, chapter 8, verse 1, concerning things sacrificed to idols, he says, we know that we all have knowledge. So he's addressing the stronger right now. Right. Yep. He's saying knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Yep. Verse 3, if anyone loves God, he has been known by him. So there's an effectual kind of knowledge that we should have that's driven by love and concern for others. How does anyone love God? Because they've been known by him. How have they been known by him? Because of his love. Yeah. We love because God first loved us. Right. And so God's love was a concern for us who are weaker, he being stronger. And we'll see that as it plays out in a minute here. But just... Just to go over a couple things, he, he's saying here in chapter 8, there's no such thing as an idol. We know that there's, no, there, there's only one God. Right. There's no such thing as some kind of pantheon of gods. There's no such thing as theological dualism. There, there's none of that going on. There is one God, and a lot of argument has been made that this is kind of like the Shema. There's one God, the Father, one Lord, Jesus, and we exist through him. But as you read earlier from verse 7, talking about the person whose conscience is weak, is defiled. It's because they're seeing something and they're being, it's like peer pressure. They're being pulled into it. Right. I'm seeing this guy do it. My pastor's, you know, on the front row. Right. Drinking whiskey. Right. Right now before he gets up to go preach the sermon. So there can't be anything wrong with it. And then he goes and then he does the same thing and he's convicted. Right. And this is what we see all around us in the world. This is like with false guilt and stuff like that. Right. Right? Yeah. Does it bother you? Yes. Why? I feel guilty. (laughs) Do you want to do it though? Yes. Okay, so stop feeling guilty about it. Right. That's not training the conscience. That's searing the conscience. That's searing the conscience. And so we never lead with the action, doing the action until we become numb to it. That's searing the conscience. We we have to get truth into our mind. So we're either going to add something in or take something away. Right. That knowledge almost always um, is going to be scripture, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes you didn't understand something scientific. Right. You know? Right. I, well, I thought that abortion was okay. I know murder's wrong, but I thought abortion was okay because I thought it was just like a tumor, like a clump of cells, because that's what I'd been taught. Right. But then you find out, no, look, this is actually a human. Yeah. Then you go, oh, whoa. <clears throat> so you got information that was, out, that was outside of scripture. Right. That you, that you didn't have before. And you're like, oh, wow. Whoops. Yeah. This yeah. is a big whoops. Yeah. And so you repent. And so you see this in 8.1, the knowledge puffs up, but loves builds up. So the knowledge puffing up would be, I have freedom to do this. Yep. And I'm sorry that you're weak and I'm just going to do it. 
Yeah. No, that's, that's arrogant. That's knowledge puffing up, but the love is going to have a deep care and concern for your weaker brother. Yeah. And you're going to want to take care of his conscience in two respects. So the first respect of course, is that he doesn't mute his conscience. Right. And so you don't eat it in front of him because you can tempt him in one of two ways. One would be that he jumps in too soon. Okay. It's not sin, but then he, a day later he goes back and thinks it was, and now his conscience is, yeah. you know, condemning him. Or it could be that he knows it's sin, but sin loves company and it's sinful and it's tempting to him. And he sees you doing it. Well, it's sin in his mind. He sees you doing it. And now he's more bold to sin against his conscience. And you do not want that to happen. That's no. the real stumbling of the brother. Yeah, right? absolutely. That's why he gets into this warning here. See to it that this verse nine, authority, this right, maybe your Bible says liberty or freedom, yep. does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. So yeah, you have the right to do this, mm. but what are you doing with that right? And then look at verse 10. If he sees you like to your point, will not his conscience be built up to eat things sacrificed to idol, idols? And then this is, this is the... This is crazy. Look at verse 11. For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined. Mm -hmm. The brother for whose sake Christ died. So mm -hmm. now he's, he's saying, now here's, you've been framing this as far as, I know there's no such thing as an idol. You've been framing this individualistically. You haven't been framing this in terms of having corporate solidarity, having union within the body of Christ. You've been looking like, Oh, I'm a Christian. I mean, I prayed the prayer. I made the decision. I walked the aisle. Whatever, I got saved. So it's about me, and I have my conscience and my freedom now. And and the first part, okay, let's talk about how you came to Christ. But the second part, <laughs> I have my I have my own conscience and my own freedom. Yes, you do. And now he's going to talk to us about what to do with it, because if we're just going to live it out mm -hmm. while we're trampling over others. He says in verse 12, and in that way, by sinning against the brothers and wounding their conscience when it's weak, you sin against Christ. Absolutely. So this isn't, this isn't a small thing. This is a big deal. Right. And then Paul says, I'm never going to eat meat again. And the obvious answer is going to be like, yeah, right. It's like if you know somebody that loves bacon or something, they're not going to say, yeah, I'm going to give up bacon. Like, yeah, for right. six weeks, maybe. Right. But Paul gets into the point in chapter 9. Do we not have authority to eat and drink? Verse four, do we not have, and he gets into all these other aspects of things he's already given up that he has yeah. a right to. He says he has a right to take a wife. He has and, a right to get paid by the Corinthian church. Yeah, yeah. But he doesn't take any of that. In verse 15, he sums it up well. But I've used none of these things and I'm not writing these things so that it will be done so in my case. For it would be better for me to die than have anyone make my boast an empty one. For if I proclaim the gospel, I have nothing to boast, for I'm under compulsion, for woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. And then, this is what Paul does with it in verse 19. For though I'm free from all, I'm not bound to anyone else's conscience. Right, right. I've made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. And then he goes through these categories of these people, and then in the weirdest section, he throws in there, do you not know in verse 24 that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run and So he's saying, taking these freedoms and these liberties and getting rid of them for the sake of your brother, that's a weaker yeah. brother, is running in a way that is to win. Right. Yeah. Which it's, it's, it's weird because it's like stronger. Yes, do it. Like right. we think, you know, like I played yeah. football. It's like walk it off. Right. Right. Paul's not saying walk it off. Yeah. He's saying, let's sit down and let's think through this together. Yeah, because he's so gospel-centered that he doesn't want any, and I mean anything, to stand between his proclamation of the gospel and building up of saints in the truth of the gospel, right? And so he can have a wife. Other apostles have a wife. No, that'll distract from the gospel, right? I can get paid. No, I don't want anybody questioning my motives on this. I'm yep. going to make tents during the day, and I'm going to preach the gospel at night, right? Yeah. It's so he, and then he, he doubles it down. Like he only brings it up as a last case scenario to prove his point. And he says, now that I brought it up, I cannot exercise these things, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's because I've already brought it up and I don't want my boasting uh, to be an empty one. Right. Yeah. And a side note, if you're a church that doesn't pay your pastor because Paul didn't take a paycheck, you're sinning against your pastor. Unless specifically he said, mm -hmm. I don't want to take a paycheck. Because right. you're imposing something on his conscience you don't have the authority to do. He has the authority to give it up. You don't have the authority to impose it on him. Absolutely. And just as a side note, you don't want your pastor uh, living hand to mouth. 
He, he shouldn't be rich, but he should not be living hand to mouth. Yeah. So. Verse, um, verse 27 sums it up too. That last section you were getting at. I discipline my body. I literally give it a black eye, make it my slave. So he, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forego all of these things. That is amazing. It is. That is amazing. And that's our example in Scripture. And so what, is, what does Paul do? And this is why he writes all of his epistles and he continues on here. Is So we protect our brother's conscience, but we don't stop there. So the example would be like, well, just modernize it, the whiskey. But the, the meat sacrifice to idols was a really clear example in that time. I mean, what's closer to evil than a meat sacrifice to idols in, in a pagan service, right? Um, so you know you have the liberty, but you know that your brother is a new believer or something to that effect. And let's say in, in the whiskey example, to, to, to modernize it, you hear or you have reason to believe that he thinks it's sinful. So you have him over. Typically, um, you might offer wine to a guest. You don't, and you don't drink of it yourself, but you don't just leave it there. You slowly over time take him to Scripture, and you inform him so as not to challenge him too harshly because you don't want to cause him to sin because that's, that's the, like, the gloating, like you know, the pool, water's warm. Come on, Johnny, jump in. Yeah. That's not how a Christian's to act in these matters. No. Right? But you inform him and you build him up in the truth, and then he'll have that freedom that he can forsake for the sake of other brothers. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. Th- that's what Paul's getting at here. Mm-hmm. He's saying, don't just push through it. That's what the world's telling you to do now. And right. That's why we have so many sociopaths. Right. But Paul's saying, be willing to give everything up, just like I am, for the sake of building others up. And then he does get into this example. He says, I always thought it was weird that he just swapped right into talking about Israel. He, he makes it clear doubly in 6 and 11 when he says these are examples for us. These are the areas where we're going to struggle. This is what Israel's gone through. These are the struggles they've had. These are the same struggles we're going to have. And there's a bit of a progression to it, too. You're yeah. going to have some idolatry. You're going to be drawn away. You're going to be craving evil things, and you're going to be led into other sins. That's why he has verse 12. Right. Be careful. You know, he who, yeah. take, who stands lest he fall. Yeah, yeah. But then he gets down verse 23. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but that of the other person. Eat anything that's sold in the meat market without asking questions for conscience sake, because everything belongs to the Lord. And then we talked about these other verses. But in verse 31, which is in context, think about it now. Whether then you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. One of the ways we do these things to the glory of God is by considering the brother for whom Christ died. That's why he says, give no offense to Jews or Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many so that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Now, right. that's crucial. I want to yeah. go back to Romans 15, what you were pointing at. And so we can see that because the same thing is made right after he goes over this with the Romans in in Romans 14. Verse 2, each one is to please his neighbor for his good to his building up. For even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. This is gospel-centered living. Yeah. That's what the... Paul's saying, yeah, I'm strong and I'm looking at all these things right, but I'm willing to give them up for the sake of of those for whom Christ died. Right. Step back a second and you think Philippians chapter 2. Although he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, yep. but emptied himself right. by taking the form of a slave. That's what's going on here. This is the gospel being lived out. We have in Romans chapter 5, for while we were weak, he is the strong one. Yeah. Different categories, but while we were weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And yeah. so... When it says, therefore, accept one another, Romans 15, 7, as you read earlier, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. There's that model. Yeah. Christ laid down. He had all these rights, all these privileges. He could have crushed us all, burned us like ants in a magnifying glass, stomped us out. Yep. He, he could have demanded worship of us. He could have demanded that we be in hell for an eternity, all these different and things. And it would have not only been morally neutral, it would have been morally right It would have been right. So. He still yeah. would be loving. He'd still yeah. be holy. He'd still be just. He'd still be good. Yep. Nothing about him would change. Right. 
But he didn't do that. He, no. be, he being strong, laid down his rights to help those who are weak yeah. in a specific group, his people. And so we too are supposed to do that same thing. When we're strong in an area, it's not to gloat, it's not to boast, it's so that we who are being strong would have something, have these rights. Because how do you know if somebody loves you? I love you, sending good thoughts your way. No, when they sacrifice, when something's given up, right. they give something up to be with you. They've given up time with their family to help you through this trial. Something along those lines. And that's what Christ has done. And then he gives us all these liberties and all these rights that we have so that we can go to the brothers and we can lay them down and yeah. we can serve them. Man, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I get um, a really encouraged spirit just, just discussing it. So uh, be gospel-centered because if you eat or drink without thinking of your brother, that's not to the glory of God. That is yeah. not co- gospel-centered. That's by definition in the flesh because you only care about your own fleshly fulfillment, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Good. So moving along, it's important to note that no one's conscience perfectly matches God's will. So if you're a Christian and you know of a brother who's a little bit weaker and you have clarity on that issue and you've, you've searched the scriptures and you know that, okay, I have an informed conscience on this issue, he's uninformed, don't get puffed up let, <laughs> lest you stumble because, trust me, your conscience does not perfectly match God's will. And you need guardrails, you need to look to scripture, you need to be informed as well. We don't stop being informed in these matters. Yeah, we, we always want to obey our conscience. Yes. Um, unless the only time we should push through something is when we we see a clear command in Scripture and we're off. So some principles to think through is our conscience belongs to and is beholden to God. God mm-hmm. is the judge, right? right? You see that in Isaiah 33, in James chapter 4. You see that all over the place. Conscience binds the subject and no one else. My conscience binds me. Yep. That's it. My conscience doesn't even bind my wife. Your your conscience will not bear witness against anybody else on judgment day. No. No. And so then we know we know we need to be careful not to bind, harm, or offend someone else's conscience. And the other thing, and this is gonna where it's gonna tie into last season, conscience limits all earthly authorities. Oh yeah. Going back to when we launched the podcast. Conscience limits all. So what does the conscience do? Again, remember, it either accuses and condemns or exonerates and absolves. So you're looking forward to something. Um, I'll show you. It works in syllogisms. So I I wrote some out here. So you have, thinking about this, conscience uses logic. You might not hear it like this in your head, but this is how it works. There's a major premise that you get from Scripture. For example, all murderers deserve hell. All murderers deserve hell. Your minor premise, I am a murderer. Conscience bearing weight in line with your memory. I have hated my brother. And that is equated to murder in scripture. Conclusion, and here's where your conscience pronounces the judgment. I deserve hell. And you know, when you're setting out to do something and you're thinking through it and you're like, that might be wrong. I don't know if I should do that. That's your conscience. And it starts bringing scripture when you've trained it up so that you know. Or sometimes maybe you'll do this because you think you're being slick. I don't know if that's right. Well, I'm going to do it anyway. So I should, shouldn't look into it too much because I don't <laughs> want to harm my conscience. That is sin. That is sin. And that's not what we want to do. Remember Hebrews 5 says, Solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So we want to be thinking through training our conscience on these things. Because the conscience isn't moral, but it's going to operate based on what it perceives as moral. Yep. And then we have to hold this other one, too, to your point. Having a good conscience is different than having a pure conscience. Right. Remember in Acts 23, 1, when Paul's standing before the Sanhedrin, he says, brothers, I've, I've lived my life in all good conscience up to this day. And you scratch your head at that and you go, how is it that Paul, <laughs> who murdered Christians, yep. has a good conscience? Right. Because he didn't go against his conscience to do that. Right. Watching, watching and pursuing these Christians die, he's carrying out the law. Yep. He in, thinks he's doing what's right. In his mind. In his mind. Yeah. And so that's, that's where you have, you see this struggle go on too with Peter in Acts 10. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Yeah. His first response, no, <laughs> by no means, Lord, I can't do that. 
there's nothing intrinsically wrong with eating that food, but he was under an administration where he was told he couldn't. And now he's being told that he can. Yep. And so he's trying to work through that. And right. he's like, I can't do this. And right. so you see him struggling with this issue of conscience. And so we see that importance of following your conscience. You do not hit the snooze button. You do not sear your conscience at all. That needs to be trained to be sensitive. That's what having a heart of stone and a heart of flesh is. Your heart of flesh is more sensitive to God's law. But likewise, you need to train in knowledge. So Paul, his conscience didn't bother him. He needed to be informed, right? And so if you're a weaker brother and you've been shown from Scripture in a well, honestly, whether it's loving or not, uh, the truth is the truth. But I was going to say, hopefully your brother presents it to you in a loving, patient way over time. Yeah. But once that truth's been shown to you in Scripture, if you still don't think it's right just because it doesn't feel right to you, that's idolatry. You've basically created a God in your own mind, and you said, God, I know that you've said this is right, but, and I have clear evidence from Scripture that it's okay, but I don't like it. Yeah. Yeah. That's idolatry. Yeah. You're clinging to something you shouldn't be clinging to. Right. Yeah. We've, we've got to think of, um, of the conscience, like a check engine light kind of thing. Right. And, and it needs to be calibrated like a, like a scale. You ever step on a scale and you're like, I know that's not right because I'm, uh, I'm 200 pounds and this thing's saying I'm 180 or it's saying I'm 220 or whatever. And you can tell it's off. So you've either got to add something to it or take away. In, in, in that case, the scripture has been added. What needs to be taken away is your love, whatever value, investment you've placed right. in right. that aspect of conscience that's not true. Right. I really loved my legalistic understanding because it offered me a lot of self-gratification and pride because yeah. I was fulfilling it. In the big right. picture, though, that's God's grace because you're clinging to something thinking that you're doing it meritoriously. Right. When exactly. you're not. Exactly. Exactly. And then you have more of, a, of an opportunity to trust in Christ. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's important that we offer some clarity and some distinction here in categories and differentiate for the audience matters of conscience versus just the conscience being involved, right? Yep. So we'll start with matters of conscience. So, for example, I don't like the Walt Disney Company. They like to groom children sexually. Um, and I can get into a whole list of things that they don't do. I'm not going to support Walt Disney Company anymore. However, if somebody from the church decides to take their kids to Disneyland and they post some pictures on Facebook with Mickey and Minnie, um, I would be wrong to accuse them of sin or something wrong for doing yeah. that. Right. Because that's my conscience. Right. Yep. Um, now, it's different if they were to go to a, a, a really uh, inappropriate, sinful movie produced by Disney. That's different. That's content, right? It's not the person. But just going to Disneyland and getting a picture with Mickey and Minnie, that, there's nothing wrong with that. And I have no right to push that. So that would be a matter of conscience, right? Uh, Starbucks is another example. They pay for their employees now. They've announced to uh, travel across state lines to get abortions. A lot of people in the church won't purchase their coffee anymore. But if somebody in the church does, we have no grounds to say that they're sinful for doing that. Yeah, right. and that, that's a tough one that we don't like to, those kinds of things. Um, whenever we buy a vehicle from a lot of these companies, mm -hmm. we're supporting a lot of leftist agenda. Yeah. If you've ever used Amazon, you're supporting a lot because they're taking money and giving it. Yeah. But Paul tells us we're, not, we're in the world Right? right, we're not right. supposed to go out of the world, but cer there's certain things that we're supposed to do here, and so we don't always check every time. Like if we go to a garage sale and go and buy something, are we going to stop and get the references first? Ask them if I give you this money and you give me this chair, what are you going to do with this money? Right. There, there's a sense in which everything is ruled by the evil one, but we still have an opportunity to operate here. Yeah. And there's different, and I think we've all experienced this. We're all growing at different rates. And because we're all growing at different rates, there's going to be certain things that we're going to put off and we're going to put off differently. Even added into that, the complexity of our different procl proclivities. So like Robert Murray McShane, for example, when you read his diary, talks about not going to party parties anymore. Not that he was getting drunk, but just that social likeness, not playing cards anymore, 
and, and not, not wasting time talking about anything other than what has to do with surrounding Christ and his word. Right. He didn't preach everybody has to do that. Right. But he was compelled by scripture, by prayer, by the spirit on his life. This is what I need to be doing because I'm called to redeem the time. I'm right. called to buy back the time. Right. And so you see that picture of Hebrews 12, laying aside every encumbrance right. and the sin which so easily entangles us. But God in his grace and his kindness allows us to figure those out, leads us to figure those things out. Yeah. And not just have them imposed on us. Absolutely. Because it has to be willful. It has to be from the heart. Yeah, he was gospel-centered and had a gospel mindset just like Paul, and these things were hindrances. He wasn't running as if to win. Yep. Right? Yeah. Good. So there are issues that can come up that are not matters of conscience, but of course the conscience is involved, because if you're going to discuss these things with believers, that's what you're going to appeal to. Mm -hmm. And if their conscience isn't seeing it, then you're going to try to inform them and then appeal to the conscience. Yep. Right? So th an example would be what prompted our podcast in the first place was whether or not to open your church during a government lockdown. Yeah. So this is a really good one because what we tend to think of is, oh, these are all issues of conscience. No. But what we actually have... Issues of conscience, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced issues of conscience come up where there is nothing spoken directly to it in Scripture. Right. doesn't mean Scripture is insufficient. Scripture is sufficient to answer that through principles. Right. But it doesn't specifically say, what about eating ice cream on a Sunday? Can I make a milkshake or am I violating the Lord's Day? No, it doesn't say that. What you have in, in that situation that you brought up, though, is where you have... Not the lack of commands, but you have two commands. Right. We're to obey the magistrate, and at the same time, we're to not forsake the gathering. We're right. to gather together. Right. So what do you do in those situations? It's not an issue of conscience. Jesus makes that clear when he heals people on the Sabbath. Yes. You've got two things going on there. You have to love your neighbor, and Jesus is able to do that in a special way yep. that other people weren't able to. But at the same time, you have to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. And Jesus is teaching that when these two things come into conflict, there is one command that is to rise up over the other one. Right. And being informed is knowing the proper order of priorities. Yes. Yes. And in, this, in that situation, we do not forsake gathering. No. We obey God right. rather than men, even though God placed that person. And we know the same thing happens if you're in a family, right? Yep. And your parent tells you to sin. You, you, in every area you can submit, you do, but you obey God. And so we want to be training people's consciences because all, all of the people that closed their church were making a decision that I'm not going to allow the free exercise of conscience for the people that attend this church. I'm right. going to bind their conscience with my conscience yeah. by binding it to the state. Absolutely. Yeah. They were abusing the conscience of the people in their church Yeah, and telling them, this is how you need to think. When the first overarching command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm sorry, you don't think that includes corporate worship? Of course it does. And now that things have kind of smoothed out seemingly for a while, mm -hmm. people are going back to these churches Yeah, and they're taking church less seriously, which is to be expected. But one of the things I haven't seen from a lot of these churches is repentance. No. They've sinned. Yeah, now they're just trying to pretend like nothing happened because we don't have that much time, but history is already judging them not kindly. Yeah. And it's only going to get worse. Yeah. And in 50 years to 100 years, the Christian literature is going to be universal in their condemnation of them. And when you've mandated masks and temperature taking and all that stuff, what you're doing, you're not loving your neighbor. I mean, think about this. In Romans, when he gets 11 chapters in with filling up the gospel and everything. His focus is on doing everything as a living sacrifice, Romans 12. And the argument that, that we heard in one of our episodes was that you have to obey the higher law of love and COVID is evil. So we lay down our gathering to help people out. No. But the point that Paul makes here is that we set aside all fleshly things right. in order to pursue the building up of others in Christ, which is spiritually. Amen. And so that would mean that we would be willing to die and not forsake the assembly. Just like I'd be willing to die not eating meat to see my brother built up. Right. 
It's the entire thrust there. You see it in church history as well. Um, in Christ, you know, he who would save his life will lose it. It's clear in Scripture that the spiritual overtakes in priorities the, the, the physical. And for them to take a position that the physical safety of your brother is more important than informing their spiritual conscience. I mean, yeah. I mean, we've, we've, we've gone yeah. to, to great lengths to expose how, how dangerous that is. So they were searing the consciences of people in their churches because no doubt there were a great number of people. I don't care what church you're talking about. There's a certain group of people in there that knew that they need to be worshiping their God. Yep. And their elders sinned against their conscience. Exactly the opposite of what we've been talking about right here. Helping them sear the conscience of those for whom Christ died. That's right. So we talked about the matters of conscience, and then, of course, now we're going into the conscience involvement. So the first example was whether or not to open your church. Um, this is a little bit more dicey example, but we'll just cover it briefly, is whether or not a church can support the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so the answer to that is no, right? And because the movement itself is antithetical to the gospel and antithetical to Christianity. It's a movement, yeah. It's not a business, the only right. sense it is, but it's not offering any goods or services. Right. Now, there's a difference. You could buy your groceries from a store owned by the leader of Black Lives Matter, Yeah. but you cannot support the Black Lives Matter movement. You could choose either well, to or not. Yeah, shop yeah. there. To sh yeah. You're right. I wouldn't shop there, but that wouldn't be sin. To yeah. shop there because that's commerce directly related to your life that God has given us freedom to pursue physical life on this earth as long as it doesn't come into conflict with uh, his commands. Yep. Right? Good. So now let's close here with um, some principles of conscience that they can take home. We've, we've talked uh, with an overarching outline, but I think it'd be good for them to take these home. And if you're taking notes, I highly encourage you. Here are some principles. Principle number one, morality and behavior must be rooted in theological truth, right? Yep. So your conscience matters. You should obey it, but not informing your conscience is no excuse. It has to be rooted in truth. Every, everything is theological. Yes, everything is theological. Number two, there are three moral cag categories, excuse me, right, wrong, and inconsequentials. Yeah, also yeah. known as a diaphora, right? right? Neither here nor there. So eating ice cream on a Sunday. Yeah. Is that right or is that wrong? Right, exactly. So number three, the diaphora that you referred to, things which are in and of themselves indifferent when acted out are never indifferent but always right or wrong depending on how and why they are used when viewed through the lens of 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether we eat or we drink or whatever we do, do all to the glory of God. So exactly. that ice cream, you're eating that ice cream on Sunday, are you eating that ice cream to the glory of God? Do you think that it's wrong to eat ice cream on a Sunday and you're still doing it? Even though it's something that's indifferent, you've sinned. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think that there's nothing wrong with eating ice cream on Sunday, but you know that you've had an agreement with your spouse that we're going to abstain from sugar and you eat it? It's wrong. Are you eating the ice cream to the glory of God, saying, Lord, thank you for this ice cream and this taste so refreshing after a hard day's work um, in, at, at church or something like that? Or if it's on the Lord's Day, uh, after, after um, a, a long day fellowshipping with the saints and, and counseling with people and praying with people, enjoy it to the glory of God and, and give him thanks for right. the gift of ice cream and the gift of taste buds. Right. And we don't tend to think of it this way, but it's the same principle that's involved in Killing. Believe it or not, killing in and of itself is morally neutral. It's why are you killing, mm -hmm. right? If you're an executioner killing a, a convicted murderer, you're doing right, right? Yeah. If you're a, a police officer defending a school, we just had a school shooting, and you go in and you kill the assailant, you are doing right. Yeah. If you take your brother's life because he angered you, that's sin. So even killing is morally neutral, but it's all in the motive. In the same way, why are you eating? Why are you drinking? Yep. Right? Well, the why is the most important Christian question. Exactly. So number four, even if a behavior is not objectively morally wrong, if a person thinks it is wrong, then commits the, the behavior he sins. 
So we went over that. Yep. Number five, a Christian should model Christ's sacrificial love in building up Christ's people and protecting other Christians from temptation and sin, even when those other Christians are somehow weak or immature in their moral judgments, right? Yep. Number six, a Christian's behavior should not be governed simply by the ultimate categories of right and wrong. You've, asked, you've said that many times, Joey, just to pause there. Uh, many Christians ask, is this sin? And that's the wrong question, right? Yep. You've said that many times. How does this bring the maximum glory to God? Exactly. So in the realm of the idea for a Christian's behavior must be shaped by a concern for A, other Christians' spiritual health, B, that which is profitable and edifying in Christ, and C, as a witness with an aim toward the conversion of non-believers, right? So it's all about, we're coming back to this theme, it's the why. Where's your heart? What are you pursuing? What race are you running, right? Yep. Good. So keep those frameworks in mind as you're thinking through those. Hopefully this will help you think through those questions that we posed to you in the beginning, right? About the Catholic mask, about the wedding at the mosque, about attending secular universities. So think about these principles that we talked about as you uh, answer those. And so uh, I'm really excited about the next episode, Joey. So we're going to get into it and it's going to be still on the conscience, but we're going to get into modern abusers and of course, the relentless assault that happens in the world um, and even in the church on the conscience of believers. Yeah, right? I'm looking forward to it too. Absolutely. So as you inform your conscience, remember there is no king but Christ. And be lovingly obedient. You need to weigh in on the cost factor and count the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. It will cost you popularity. It will cost you promotion perhaps at times. It will cost you an easy life. You will have to discipline yourself. You will have to buffet your body. You will have to say no to temptation. You will have to say no to this world. You will have to break with the crowd. You will have to be willing to stand alone for Christ. You will have to be willing to walk to the beat of a different drummer and to, to step out of the crowd even if no one follows after Jesus Christ. You'd be willing to stand if you're the only person in the world for Jesus Christ. That's the cost factor.